Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Cedar Rapids City Council. Thank you all for coming. Would you please rise and join me for a flag salute? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And justice for all. Okay, Council, uh, you have before you items A through I on the consent calendar. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion we approve consent calendar for the June 14th meeting, item A through F. I. Is A through I? Yeah, it continues yeah. on the next page. Next page through I. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Second. Oh. Mm. Okay, a motion was made by Council Member Lemley and seconded by Council Member Owen to approve the consent agenda uh, calendar items A through I. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Carries unanimously. Thank you, Council. So next up, we have a special presentation from uh, PSE, Mr. Walt Blackbird, on a new program that they're offering in town to help our businesses. Uh, appreciate you coming. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the time and the opportunity. Uh, my name is Walt Blackford. I'm an outreach manager for uh, Puget Sound Energy. I'm joined tonight by my colleague, Lynn Murphy, who works in the government affairs. Probably most of you know her. I think she lives nearby. Um, this particular program we call the Small Business Direct Install. Um, we go into towns like yours, not always this small, but we try to do some small ones as well. Uh, we pick about a three-day time frame, two to three days, uh, where a team of people comes in and goes door-to-door -to, -door to small businesses and helps them come up with some ideas for increasing their energy efficiency and thereby reducing their costs. This uh, slide will just outline the over way, way high level of the program, uh, reinforcing my comment that it's all about small businesses here. And uh, what we found over time is that it's somewhat difficult for them to access uh, other programs that aren't specifically for them. And for those, whoops, too far. This is sensitive. For those reasons, they typically don't have a lot of extra cash laying around. Um, they're renters. They probably don't take a lot of their business time to research energy efficiency. And um, they like to get know that their investment will pay them back quickly. There we go. So our role, or my role, is to uh, introduce the idea to the, to the city, to the key players in the city. So we reached out to the mayor and to Paula Kelly at the Chamber of Commerce and tonight embracing the council and bringing you into the, into the tent. Uh, this morning, in fact, there were four of us who walked to downtown and delivered that wonderful brochure uh, just to create a little buzz. So people are looking for us in two weeks. I think you need a better model. But. Yeah. <laughs> it was the best I could do in a really short time, you know. It was well received, though, I should say. And then on the days, or the days of, which I may have overlooked, is June 27th, 28th, and if necessary, the 29th, um, we go into each workplace, each storefront, and uh, we have a techno technical guy with me or with the other PSC people, and they'll do a complete energy assessment of the facility, uh, leaving behind a little report to, to allow the property owner or the business owner to uh, identify things they could do to further increase their efficiency. There are many measures that we will do on site, I mean, in, in uh, direct installs while we're there, and the ones that can't be done in a moderate time frame, we will schedule uh, to come back and do them. But mainly we replace a lot of light bulbs. Anybody who hasn't upgraded their linear uh, CFL or uh, uh, neon lights to uh, uh, T12s, we will 
from T12 to T8, we will do that for free. There are a few measures that we offer that require a small copay. And on this next page, this is just good. <laughs> Too many. This is just a list of the kinds of things we will do for a business, either for free or at a very low cost. A lot of ways to help restaurants, particularly in the kitchen. And I've lost one of my pictures. But the main thing is we, we come through and, as I said, it'll probably be a two-day blitz here. We'll, do, we'll concentrate on the Metcalf and the surrounding blocks. As time allows, we'll spread it out a little further. And then I'll come back, if you wish, and give you a report at the end uh, a few weeks later on uh, how much energy we were able to save. Great. Thank you, Walt. Does council have any questions on the program, on the light bulbs? I want to know, uh, on an average size business, I don't know, Stizos or something down the road, what are they saving by converting? Uh, well, the, the conversion to from incandescence to LEDs, if that's that's the biggest spread, mm -hmm. if you still have the old incandescence, the, the LED replacement typically uses only 30% as much energy. So it's substantial potential savings if you still have older bulbs. If you've already upgraded to, uh, in some ways, then the additional savings, it's very slightly incremental. Well, I appreciate you coming and doing this in our town and helping out the merchants because any way we can keep our businesses happier and do them better, it, it's important to us. Okay. What about, um, we usually light our downtown during the holiday time with a lots of strings of lights. Yeah, well, uh, could uh, PSE string all of our downtown with uh, LED lights? You mean actually do the stringing or provide the lights or both? Why not? Both. <laughs> I believe that Lynn Murphy would be the best person for you to talk to about that. So we're technically also not a business. It's a business wow. thing. Yeah. But we do have some programs that might help. Oh, cool. Yep. Right. Um, Besides businesses, do you work with nonprofits? I'm, I'm thinking of one specifically, the museum here in town. Yep, yep. I've talked to Aaron about the museum. And, uh, and yeah, it, it's just to any commercial account, and a nonprofit would be like a commercial account. Thank you. Did you have questions? Yeah. I was wondering if you did other things. I mean, I, I thought I saw that on there, but it seems like maybe their appliances are out of date. Do you, so a separate program for with that? businesses, we will tell, like in a restaurant particularly, we will tell those managers or owners about those programs because we do have some replacement uh, options for fryers and and uh, washing machines, you know, dishwashers and things like that. I don't think it made it onto the flyer, yeah. but it is something we would tell those customers about. So, Walt, I, I see there's some questions in the audience. Will you stick around later? Um, we, we don't take those right now, but would you stick around and, and ask those people to help them out, please? Uh, sure, for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. I, okay. So if you have a question for Walt, he'll be in the back and he can answer it for you. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. So next up is our public comment period. Um, as most of you know, you're allowed three minutes uh, at the lectern. State your name and address for the record. And uh, remember, you are addressing the council, not each other. It's not a time for question and answer. But you do get to uh, give us your opinion. So do uh, you have any takers for public comment? Yes, sir. Have one item before we go into other matters. Um, Nathan Salcina, 694 Brickyard Boulevard, also the Public Works Operations Supervisor for the city. Um, I wanted to take just a quick second to uh, introduce a volunteer real quick to the council and mayor. Um, Peter Adams, um, he's a, a local railroad uh, historian and um, hobbyist, I guess. And um, he's been doing some, you guys might have seen him in the, over the last couple of years doing some touch up painting, different things out on the, the engine out at the entrance the town. Uh, 
anyway, I just wanted to introduce you guys to him, and um, he might have something he wants to say. Uh, he's very interested in um, possibly even seeing the uh, the engine operational again someday. Um, he does that kind of restoration work, but I'll, I'll let him tell you um, in, in his public comment about uh, his experience and his qualifications. So, uh, Peter. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah, my name is uh, Peter Adams at 197 West Pole Road, Linden, Washington. Well, like Nathan was saying, uh, I've basically uh, been uh, working on the steam engine for a couple years now and uh, would like to see it uh, up and running someday. And it's not always about, uh, you know, the money cost. It's just, you know, I, I just do it because I love it. It runs in my family history. You know, I, like I said, uh, relative of mine, just to give you kind of a note, is uh, was general in the Civil War and ran the Union Pacific Railroad for six years. So, you know, it just it's in the blood, you know, just down generation to generation. But currently, like I said, I've been cleaning, painting, and inspecting the engine, and, you know, it probably costs, like most people say, it probably costs, you know, 600000 you know, maybe a million, but, you know, I have a lot of friends in the railroad industry, and uh, they could really lend a hand and make it one piece again. I'd like to see, you know, back at the Cedar Rilly, uh uh, roundhouse who used to be in town here. You know, I've learned a lot about that and volunteered at Lake Whacom Railway for 12 years now and, uh, you know, just a bunch of other things. You know, it can go on for, I can stand here for four hours and talking about it, but, you know, we don't have time for that. So, anyways, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, we appreciate the work you do on it because it's a real centerpiece in the town and uh, a lot of people come just to see it and get their picture taken by it. I would uh, love to sit down with you sometime upstairs and, and chat about trains. So, so yeah. if, you, if you have time for that or care to, I'm available. Yeah. Mayor, if I may want to say, we've noticed the painting. I have two little boys who love to hang out with that train, and, and uh, we would be thrilled to see that operational. And thank you for the, the work you've done already, you know, kind of touching up the, the numbers and the, and the, I guess, the crest, whatever that is. So thank you. Next up for public comment, Mr. Splain. I need you to speak in the mic so we can record it, Tony, please. Tony Splain, 714 Shop Road. I'm also into old stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fortunately, not steam. <laughs> what about the boiler? What to, would it take to, if you're going to run it, you better do something with the boiler. It's just like the yarder over there by Cedar Willie Auto Parks. We ran into a big problem with it over the boiler to get it rebuilt and get it approved. And that was a small fortune. Yeah. So. The question is, what would you do with the boiler? Yeah. Okay, the boiler would have to go through its annual inspection to start off with. You'd have to retube all the tubes, and uh, every 15 years you have to do that. So it's like automatically the first thing you do is you have to go through and do the, the visual, and then you have to do uh, like an ultrasound on it. And to me, I looked at the boiler, and it looks pretty solid, even though it's been sitting out there for many years. So, like I said, you have to you know do the sections where you mark them off, ultrasound. And uh, if you get good numbers off of that, you can go ahead and if there's any bad numbers, you'd ask to go through and uh, cut out those pieces. But uh, the way I looked at it was, uh, you know, one time with Nathan and all that. But uh, you basically have to, uh, after that, it costs you probably about $25,000 to do retubing. And we've done that, at, I've done out that, helped out with that at Burson Park in London, you know, work with yeah, it's and all that. So it sounds like the two of you might want to exchange phone numbers and talk about this. And maybe you didn't hear the part about it's not a question and answer period, but yeah, I'm interested in it too. So yeah, because that's it. Any time you're doing the steam stuff, that's the first thing you run into is the boiler. And okay. The state has got some ridiculous tests that they run run them through. What the, even up the Deming Road show this last weekend, there was a big problem over that. 
Okay, Tony, your time is up. Thank you. Anyone else for the public comment period? Yes, sir. Dennis O'Neill at 109 Talcott Street in Cedar Woolley. And, you know, I was walking around talking to a businessman yesterday that has that antique shop uh, down across from uh, Joy's Kitchen. I think it is right next to Hometown Cafe. And as you probably know, he's moving, and he's bought or made an offer, and he's supposed to sign papers last night on the Ace Building. And luckily, he's got enough money he can make a mistake and pay cash for a building and go over and buy another building for cash. <laughs> Most people cannot do that. Right. And he said that one of the, and it's been a theme we've heard over the years here, about the parking downtown. He said he could not get he could not get any parking down there, and, and it's real frustrating. And you know, with the two restaurants right there and other businesses down there, you got Christ the King Ministry, and they they go off and on at different times and all that. Um, you know, I know we've all talked about this, trying to limit parking times down there and, and what you, whatever you can do down there. But there's a core down there that's about two blocks, and that's the major part. The same way where Hometown and Joyce Cafe is, and maybe one block further to the north, where there should be something enforced about parking limits. you got signs down there, but nobody's looking at them, and nobody's really enforcing it that much. Because everybody wants to be nice. It's a small town, but... It's killing the merchants downtown, and now you're going to have another empty building down there. It might be a little hard to rent if people can't get down there to park and walk a short distance. And some of these people down there, and some of the, some of them are sure are merchants that own those buildings, are parking and taking up the space, and then they come back and maybe make issue about what can the city do. You know, and I would read it. It's like you've got it out here, 30-minute parking. And I don't know how, it's, you know, how uh, enforced that is right out here on the street. So obviously, if you got a problem out here, they got a real problem downtown when they're trying to make money and, and pay taxes and hire people. It's not getting addressed very well. It may be addressed, but it's not being followed up on and enforced. And I was thinking, you know, we had quite a bit of time to think about that building that burned out down, downtown. And I don't know if it'll work or not, but, you know, we everybody was focused on cleaning that mess up for blast from the past. And we still had a mess down there. You got, you know, you got fencing around there. It doesn't look very, very good. And you got a hole in the ground. The building's gone, but everything else is a mess. And I don't know if anybody's talked about it, and they probably have. I probably missed it, or it might be in process, or whatever. But I wonder what the problem would be if there's no plans for that lot, and the guy wants to sell it eventually. Uh, it probably not going to happen for a while. I'd like to see somebody go make an offer to that guy to make the lot look a little better and fill the, the city could maybe fill it in and turn it into, a, you know, with just uh, dirt and gravel, fill those holes in, make it level, pack it down, and use it for, you know, even if it was only 10 or 12 parking spots, you know, sort of make a trade deal with him. Make it a little bit more presentable to market for him and at the same time improve the marketability of the downtown area by having more parking down there. Along with uh, again the limit on the parking time, about 30 seconds. And uh, uh, again, the main key, I guess, would be to enforce whatever you do. And the last thing is, you get a lot of people that are running for offices right now, as everybody knows. I don't see a lot of men here council meetings attending, listening, or offering information on what they might like to do or what they see needs to be done. I wonder if there's any way of doing a sign-in sheet, and, you know, and find it out maybe, you know, over a period of time, maybe that would be helpful. And maybe we'd get more people to apply, you know, for jobs, uh, for attendance and council. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Can I say something? Can I say something? I thought, I thought that there's parking now at the, um, where the Wells Fargo is. Then we just do that when the wool market yes, came out? They can, right? Isn't that city? We put time limits on the parking behind the Woolly Market, and everybody thought it was going to be a huge thing, and it hasn't turned out to be a huge thing. And, but isn't there also parking where the uh, Wells Fargo is, like yeah. in that lot right there? there. So I see lot. parking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, anyone else for public comment period? Mm -hmm. 
Good evening. My name is still Mary Anderson. I still live at 928 Beachley Road in Cedro Willie. I can actually speak to that parking lot behind Wells Fargo. I have spoken to the people at Wells Fargo and I asked, is there anything that the city can do to make your business easier here in Cedro Willie? And they said, yes, please, fix the parking lot. We get nothing but complaints because there is such a big pothole. It's filled with potholes. So when you ask, isn't there parking behind Wells Fargo? Yes, it is, but nobody really wants to use it because it's so terrible and damaging to vehicles. So that's that. Uh, I would like to speak a little bit about the library ILAs. It's still unclear to me what the benefit is for the citizens of Cedro Woolley, whom you represent. Uh, the citizens will pay $5 million. They give up their library collection, and apparently they will get no representation in these new ILAs. I could not find any spot where the citizens will receive representation at the Central Skagit Library. So although goodwill is claimed, it isn't guaranteed, and that concerns me on behalf of our citizens. Um, and I also would like to address the issue that $5 million is not very much for a public building with all the goodies semi-promised in these ILAs. Uh, so I'm asking you to look seriously and with fiscal integrity at these ILAs and ask yourself, are these really the best financial options for our citizens? I would also like to address an issue that I've been speaking on for about a year now. Signs directing visitors towards downtown Cedro Willie on the roundabouts of Cook Road and even Jameson Street are lamentably absent still. We have a nice one on Highway 20 and Highway 9 northbound, but all traffic on Cook Road is directed away from our historic downtown. There's no sign saying this way to our charming historic downtown Cedro Willie. Uh, another issue that has come before me uh, is the Senior Center. This issue was addressed at the last City Council meeting, and I believe air conditioning for the seniors was sidelined. For those who don't know how uncomfortable it is without air conditioning, if you are elderly, it's miserable. I would like to suggest perhaps that the air conditioning in City Hall be turned off for a couple of days, and so others may feel just how miserable it is. I would like to thank you all for listening and for your service. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And uh, that sign's coming, so thank you for bringing it up. It's on its way. Anybody else for public comment period? Okay, at this time I'll close the public comment period and we'll move on to item five, which is a public hearing on the possible surplus of the Crown Victoria um, to the Cedar Valley School District. And that is on page 80 and 82. And is this you, Aaron? Yeah. So the city can surplus uh, lots of things pretty efficiently with a resolution. In fact, you did tonight. Uh, you surplused a whole bunch of IT uh, stuff with a resolution. But if we want to do an intergovernmental transfer, it requires a public hearing. So the uh, school district has requested a vehicle that they can use for special purposes. We happen to have a vehicle that we intended to surplus. In fact, you already surplused. Uh, so rather than putting it on the marketplace and asking them to buy a vehicle that's probably worth $500 or so. Uh, the request is to give it to the district, and uh, to do so requires a public hearing. Very good. So public hearing rules. I'll open the public hearing now on this issue at 723. If anybody would like to speak uh, for or against, or just in general about whether or not we should um, move this car over the school district for their use, please come forward now, and you have three minutes. Seeing no takers, um, I will now close the public hearing on the 2003 Crown Victoria. And for council, the uh, resolution is on, recommended resolution is on page 81 of your packet, and the next resolution number is 96017. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion we adopt. Uh, Resolution 960-TAC-17, a resolution that declares surpl a surplus Crown Victoria uh, and authorize the transfer of said vehicle to the Cedar Willie School District. Second. Second. Okay, motion was made by Council Member Lemley, seconded by Council Member Cornegay to approve resolution number 960-TAC-17, a resolution of the City of Cedar Willie declaring certain property as surplus and authorizing its disposition to the Cedar Willie School District. 
Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. And the motion carries. Thank you, Council. Um, next up on the agenda is item six, public hearing on the considered of three proposed library partnership and local agreements with the Central Skagit Library District, including the Library Partnership ILA, Joint Development and Ownership ILA, and the Library Services ILA. Uh, we, just to refresh everybody's memory, or if you weren't here earlier, we had a question and answer period starting at 5.30. So at, at 7.25, I'll open the public hearing on that topic. Do I have any takers? For council, that's on pages 83 to 139. And it's a, will be a first reading. Okay, seeing no takers, I close the public hearing. And let me get to page 83. So there's no action tonight. This is a first reading, but it's a good time to di discuss it if we have any questions, comments. Mr. Mayor, um, I know we are going to have a say on the building and the budget, but after the, I guess, the agreements are signed, what input does the city have on things like the services and hours? And how can we make... Um, how can we take interest on these these sort of things to go in the future? Or is there a way? Well, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but as you would do it today with our city library, if you had preferences, I think you would take them to the library director and to the board of trustees and say, I'm a patron. I would like to see A, B, and C. What can you do for me? Well, I, I, I guess I guess to go further, as you know, as representatives of the city, bringing the residents' concerns to the to the board, we, you know, currently don't have any. I guess. What I guess the question is is, you know, outside of that, how, what influence can we have? I mean, is there any any other part of uh, we can uh, or any other changes that we can make to this agreement to have? Some sort of say as city council members or mayors to to the services that are provided at the new library or ours. Well, um, I guess I would just say that if you have a suggestion for me, I'd be happy to hear it. But I mean, the agreement is is there, and it doesn't specifically change your position or role to be anything different than it is today with the current library. I, I, I don't think I'm answering your question, but I'm not fully understanding it either. Okay. Any other comments from council? I was just curious what the um, central Skagit library hours are right now, and, and is that typical? Uh, well, um, if the director cares to speak on the hours, I offer that up to you. about a projected uh, I guess completed project do it do we have any speculation of what our hours could be like I, I know that's a big ask but looking at the flows of both libraries and merging those two has any consideration been made on those on, on like a, what a future library not only looks like in costs but what what how it's housed I think Aaron kind of addressed that question earlier during the question and answer period where we, we are not making specific requirements because operationally you know things change. Well, yeah, you don't want to you don't want to clamp down, but I guess you know, I, I think there's question, you know, to the to the broader audience of what not only will it look like and where it will be, but you know, what will it be? So I that's well, I guess if the, if we have a chance to speculate on that yet. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Council? 
So first read, this will be coming back um, for your decision. If there are areas of concern, please come on by and we'll talk about them. But uh, we've pretty much reached an agreement between our counterparts, so there's not going to be big changes. So, and process-wise, uh, the city continues to take written comments from anybody you know, between now and then, and it'll be on the council's agenda in July. Um, I think it's July. Is it July 12th? Um, and that would be meeting four of the four meetings in, in resolution 943.16. The, the district's board has not had their first reading yet. My understanding is that will occur tomorrow night. And then uh, their second reading, the district's second reading, uh, I believe is the, the week after the city council meets in July. I think they're the third third Thursday and you're the second, uh, well, first and second, or second and fourth Wednesday. So uh, just a little bit of timing on that. So public comments in writing between now and then, and then as per the resolution, there won't be a formal public hearing, but there will be another opportunity for uh, public comment prior to any potential council action on this topic at the next, uh, at the July meeting. And speaking of written comment, there's a letter on your desk that I received from a patron, so you can look at that. Um, talks a little bit, I'll let you read it, but it talks a little bit about the reciprocity agreement. So remember, the opponents of reciprocity said at the beginning that uh, we were going to be overrun and all, all the books would be checked out. So now we're two weeks into it. Um, I think we've seen something much more modest than that, just a few people in a, Deborah, I think, is Deborah back there? So how many did we have? I think you sent an email out on the, what we had this since the first, right? I'm sorry? So 32 people in two weeks, and uh, Gene, what did you have? So. so the sky did not fall is what I'm saying. All right. Um, unless we have any other comments, that's a first read, and we'll bring it back to you next time around. Unfinished business, there is none. New business, item 7, an ordinance adopting term limits for members of the city council and the mayor. This is a first reading. And uh, be, before we go into that, I think this is Aaron. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the process under which that occurred. Chuck and I have talked about it. And uh, you know, I was not happy to be surprised last week with uh, what I thought was a pop-up motion. So for the council and uh, the public and the press, I want to say that is not typically how we do business. I probably I was taken quite by surprise, so didn't know quite how to react uh, at the last meeting. But typically, these are the kind of things that should be brought up by council at a working group or um, with the staff so we can staff it, decide whether we're going to have a committee, put it on the agenda so the public knows it's coming. Um, that didn't happen, but... Uh, here we are. We went back and uh, worked on a possible ordinance, and we're going to discuss that tonight. It's on page 140 to 143. And Aaron, are you introducing us? Yeah, just uh, briefly, I think uh, Councilman Owen intends to talk about the, the motion itself or the intent behind the, the motion. Uh, I just want to orient you to what's in the packet. So the uh, council, at the last meeting, uh, Councilman Owen made a motion to limit the terms of Cedar Woolley's elected officials to two terms. It was seconded. Um, ultimately, the, the mayor asked me to make a call if the motion was order. In order, I advised it was not and that I would research it. I also opined that we probably, we the city, the city council probably lacked the authority to limit terms. Uh, so just to be clear, uh, that is not the case. Uh, I believe the city council has the power to limit terms, um, but the motion uh, would not be effective as a motion. So uh, I believe it, it was indeed out of order at the time because an ordinance would be necessary to make it effective. So uh, Councilman Owen and I talked a little bit about process and uh, 
So what's in the packet, I, because of the you know lack of a lot of detail at the last meeting, I took a guess, and what you see in the draft ordinance are uh, two new provisions to Chapter uh, 2.02 and 2.04 that are very simple. It simply says, no person shall be allowed to serve as the mayor for more than two consecutive four-year terms, and the same is true for city council. Uh, there are a number of policy considerations. Uh, what I've written for you would allow a person to be appointed to fulfill an unexpired term. Uh, that could be up to two years um, or, or potentially longer. A, a person could be appointed and then elected for an unexpired term. So you, you could imagine somebody is serving for three and a half years, then being elected for two four-year terms. That would be allowed under this. And then running for mayor and serving. Uh, this ordinance as written would also allow somebody to, after they've served two terms, to step off uh, and then um, they could run and, and serve again. Uh, theoretically, they could also uh, resign their post the last day of the year of the second term and be eligible then for the second, for the third go. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make is there are decisions for you to make if you want to have term limits. Do you want those to limit the maximum time of service, the maximum number of terms or the number of consecutive terms? Do you want to combine mayor and council, etc.? And then the last thing, I'll, so this is written very specifically, it's just two consecutive terms, wouldn't account appointed terms, and it would allow you to step off and step back in and or run for uh, mayor. And then lastly, I just uh, wanted to point out, uh, you know, of course in front of my office I've got, uh, I think I'm, I'm only missing two now mayors in the Wall of Fame, um, which is pretty good for Cedar Woolley to have almost a complete collection. Um, I just point out in the memo, we've had actually quite a few folks over the years who have served more than two consecutive terms, both uh, mayors and council members, and I just thought it was important for you to see, you know, all, all of the folks who have actually done this in this city's 119-year uh, history. And then lastly, for examples, there are four cities in the state of Washington, four out of the 281 that have term limits. Two of them are non-charter code cities like Cedro Woolley. Those are Edgewood and Port Angeles. Uh, the cities of Kent and Milton are also like us. Uh, they had them but later repealed them. So a little bit of background and I guess trivia for when you're you know, impressing people about city facts. <laughs> you, can, you can throw out that Milton used to have term limits but doesn't. And, Edgewood does. So, any questions? I'm happy to answer. I'm looking for direction tonight about what you may want drafted for a second reading. I'd like to make a couple of comments, uh, if I may, Aaron. Uh, I made the motion last week about term limits, and I, I guess I wasn't um, I wasn't complete. Uh, I meant two consecutive terms, like like you just explained. Uh, the reason I think this is good for the city, I think good, uh, clear, different young minds is good for the city. And I think you get kind of burned out after, after eight years, you know, you're, you're, all of your ideas are burned up. So we need new people to come in with, with different ideas, and I think that's that's really good for the city. So I think eight years is is plenty, and it and I think change is good. It's too bad that this don't uh, catch hold and go to Washington D.C. and kick some of those people out. <laughs> same thing with, with the Supreme Court. You know, it, uh, should have term limits. But I think term limits is healthy. I think term limits is good for the city. And uh, like I say in my motion, I guess stands. And I would like you to put that in a form of, of ordinance and maybe give us a copy of it so we can we can look at it. Would you do that? Yeah. So uh, the ordinance.
ordinance that, that you've got tonight has the two consecutive terms, and uh, certainly um, what I'm looking for from the council is, is that the direction you want for a second reading? And ultimately what I would change in the ordinance for sure is just to add more detail as to the why, because that, that part is, is missing at this point. I'd put that in there for you for next time. Aaron, I'd like to say something. You know, I know um, we'll let, we have just, some, just for the record, you don't ask Aaron to say something. Yeah, Mr. Me. Mayor, well, he's there asked us the question, Mayor. <laughs> so go ahead, Brett. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to uh, uh, give some comments to Aaron, if I may. You may. <laughs> um, I, you know, I know we've elected some big bummers uh, locally, statewide, nationally, but, you know, I believe that this sort of ordinance takes the, the power away from the people who vote for the people. They agree with them. They like the ideas. Eight years and beyond, maybe some cases, they keep voting for them. If they don't like them, they vote them out. Real simple. That's how I got elected. I replaced somebody eight years ago. And I, you know, I'm here until I step down, which I've done. Um, so I think the system that we have works well in our city today. And I don't, well, I wouldn't, I'm not interested in changing it because I think the people are smart enough to decide who to vote for and who not to vote for. And if, and if they don't like the person in office, they can run somebody to replace that person. Anybody else have comments? Jermaine? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that term limits, kind of like Brett saying, that term limits are just elections. And if you're unhappy with someone, you... I mean, obviously I've been happy with uh, Councilmember Limley for quite a while, you know, and um, if there's someone that... Each, I mean, Brenda's facing a challenge. I mean, that's just how term limits work. That's elections. And then keeping the power in the hands of the people to elect who represents them. And if they like that person, then that should be, that should be an option. Um, I think that it's up to the voters to decide who represents them and not government. Oh, I wanted to also ask, I'm sorry, Go ahead. but I wanted to ask also, um, are any of those other cities by ward? Because, you know, we, we are kind of distinctive that way. There are not a lot of cities that have wards, and so the, the pool is kind of small. <laughs> In those words. I don't know. I have to look, and I'm happy to do that if you're interested in having that information for next time. Okay. Thank you. So um, I've, I've given this some thought. Um, I, on the one hand, I'm very much in agreement with Chuck that nationally we have a problem, but I was trying to think what the problem is here that would, we would be trying to solve. So nationally, the problem is you have incumbents who have huge resources and they stay there forever because once you're elected, you have the ability to get lots of money. So. We, I would love to see term limits nationally, and I would like to see campaign reform nationally. But locally, that doesn't exist, and, and there's proof of that. Um, I think Brenda ran against an incumbent last time. She won. Chuck ran against an incumbent last time. He won. Um, there's other examples where I think this would have been terrible. Rick, I practically begged him to run for the last term, frankly because I thought the other candidate was totally unqualified and and would have been had a chip on his shoulder and wanted to get even with the city. That was my opinion of the man. Very well, you may have your opinion. But my point is is that we've had Rick's been a great councilman for a long, long time and we wouldn't have had him. So and in Jermaine's case there's nobody who's even interested enough to run against her. So either they think she's great or we don't have enough people who are interested in the job. So I think that uh, we're at home. This doesn't make any sense. Natu nationally, I think it makes a lot of sense. Tony, this is not a public comment time. You can speak next time at the second reading. Anything else, guidance for staff? Did, 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 did. Uh, can I add something else? I'm uh, sorry. Chuck's first. Yeah. I, I got a question for you, Mr. Mayor. Do every time I want to make a motion, do I have to come and, and ask you or discuss it with you? 
No, but typically we bring these things up at work sessions and we take them to committee or you ask to put something on the agenda. It's how we do things. It's respectful to the rest of the council so they know what's coming. It's respectful to the public so we can have it on the agenda so they know what we're going to speak about. That's how we do it. So to answer your question, yes, that is much preferable. Well, if that's what you want, that's fine. But I, I, I thought I could make a motion without having to run it through you. Well, we do make motions sometimes for things that are time sensitive, amendments to contracts, uh, you know, lighthearted things like it's Ladybug Month. But this is a substantial motion that affects the public's ability to, to vote for who they want. So, um, you know, and you all the time tell me you want the people to make the choice. Now you're saying four people will make the choice for everybody else on who they can vote for. I disagree with it. Jermaine. I, I, just, I just wanted to kind of, I don't know, it's kind of along the same lines, but um, I, I was just going to say that I remember when I was running, when I was considering it, I did it out of respect of my former council member, Tony Splain, and, and called him to ask him if he was planning to run again um, because I don't think I would have challenged him and that was, I mean, but that was the choice that I had and that's the choice of the people in the board. And he didn't tell me whether he, of course he didn't tell me. <laughs> he left it up to me to decide what I wanted to do and I respect that and I just wanted to thank you for that. Anything else? Aaron, do you have enough to go back for, uh, to prepare this resolution? Well, it sounds like uh, the substance of the ordinance is fine to bring back for a second reading and I'll, I'll offer some additional, um, you know, uh, basis for why uh, along the lines of what Councilman Owen has stated and I'll also find out if, if those two cities are elected by a ward or at large. I, I was just looking now and it looks to me like Edgewood's at large, uh, which is pretty common. You know, we're, we're a little unique to have the ward system, although the Voting Rights, Rights Act is pushing other cities to go to a ward-based system. So yeah, I'll, I'll figure that out and bring that back to you. Okay, so that was the first reading. And uh, Chuck, of course, you're always welcome to come in and talk about it and massage the wording so that we get it to the, you know, the intent of your motion. Okay, moving on to committee reports. Um, looks like Sergeant McElwraith. I have nothing for you. Very good. Hey, Dennis, don't run away. Stay. Mayor, Council, uh, just uh, trying to uh, remind you that the Cedarway School District, uh, Cedarway Police, and Cedarway Fire District 8, and other cities throughout the county, we've been working very hard uh, here over the last few months on uh, active shooter uh, training for the schools. Uh, we've got two drills that are coming up, one June 21st, which will be an active shooter drill up at Samish School, and then August 22nd at Cedarway High School. School. The one at Cedarway High School will be a uh, very, um, I guess the term I'm looking for, very uh, loud uh, training. And uh, at, we're going to be coming back to the council probably in July because we're going to have to close down some streets for that training that we'll bring back to you to, uh, for approval. Um, if there are uh, councilmen that wish to um, observe the training, uh, you're encouraged to do so, but there are also some uh, some limits to what you have to be able to go through a training course because it is very graphic and it's it's a very very real sense of what happens when something like this goes on. So they, they are, there's a little prep that you have to attend before they allow you to actually be an observer inside the the shooting. Um, I would like to. All right, and I will bring that up with Chief Tucker. I got calls going on, excuse me. <laughs> um, 
we also we now have you, you've seen me come back to you so many times saying hey we're, we're hiring we're looking for more people we're actually got a full house now in our quarters first time in almost a year uh, which is really really nice uh, one of the bad things about that is though now we're going to have to start a training academy we'll be uh, starting up a countywide academy that Cedar Woolley will again run for the umpteen dozen years in a row uh, we'll, we'll put the academy on it's opened up to the entire uh, county and we'll be hosting that here in town and that'll run for the next three months uh, that starts in July and uh, along with all that going on we're also ramping up along with the police department for the 4th of July uh, starting to get crews set and uh, just get ready for the festivities all right. all right well I'm glad we're hosting it because you guys do a good job John well, the Planning Commission is going to be holding a public hearing on uh, Tuesday night, and the Public Works Department, Mark Freiberger, is going to be giving a presentation about the six-year uh, transportation improvement plan before it comes to, uh, to the Council. The Planning Commission is going to hold a public hearing on that. Um, and just uh, the operations in planning and building department have been really busy lately. Uh, this year we've had uh, a, rather a spike in residential building permits, and so it's been extremely busy, and you'll see a lot of uh, just about any vacant lot in town uh, people are clamoring to find and build houses on, so you'll probably see houses popping up in vacant lots and uh, a lot of activity up in uh, Stock Mountain View Estates as well as some infill projects. The, the large apartment building picked up their permit, so they'll be getting, roll, getting rolling here, I mean, if they haven't already. That's all I got. Okay, thank you, John. Any questions for John, Council? Mark? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a time-sensitive issue for you tonight. Uh, you have on your DS uh, late material. <coughs> Um, sorry to bring this to you at such short notice, but it's developed over the, just the last couple of days. As you know, one of our projects was this year uh, for this year was due to do crack sealing on arterial streets. Uh, we've hired a contractor, Hyzinga Enterprises LLC, who started that work on Monday. It uh, quickly became apparent that our our, our budget estimate for uh, crack sealing uh, quantity was significantly off. And this is no reflection on the estimator in this case, uh, because uh, we haven't done this for quite a long time, uh, and uh, cracks are difficult to see, uh, even though you can see them, uh, the bigger ones, in the pavement, uh, until you start blowing them out and uh, processing them and chasing them, uh, you don't really know how many there are. Uh, we have completed crack sealing on State Street uh, from Township to, um, uh, I think it's about 4th, and on Ferry Street from uh, Northern to Township and then a piece of Township Street itself. We had intended to do quite a few more streets. In fact, that's only about 40% of what we had planned. And it became obvious yesterday that we were going to run out of our total 30,000 square foot or lineal foot estimate uh, well before that. And so uh, I worked with Nathan and we, we basically came up with a slight increase for the contractor and stopped them at the end of that uh, rather than risk running out of budget. So one of the things that is not complete that I feel is important to, to do is uh, Cook Road. That's our busiest arterial in the city at this point, yeah. uh, beyond, uh, beyond State Street, which is close. Um, and we'd still like to finish that. There's about eight blocks on that to do. And also, as you know, uh, we, we have added as an, uh, an amendment to this contract to do the crack sealing of the concrete intersection at Cook and Ferry. Uh, so I am short of uh, budget money to do that at this point. And what I am proposing to Council uh, is to issue a second addendum to Heisinga to uh, add in some additional budget so that we can complete the crack sealing on Cook Road this year. We would defer the rest of the projects that are planned until 2018 um, and then also complete the concrete uh, ceiling that we also shouldn't let go any longer at uh, Cook and Ferry. 
So the methodology that I've approached this with for the additional funding uh, would be from the Transportation Benefit District. Uh, we had already allocated 75000 for crack sealing uh, this year from that fund. Uh, that's one of the primary uh, purposes for that fund is arterial maintenance. And uh, you'll find on the third page of your memorandum there uh, a look at the project list for the TBD. This is my draft for next year's. I've added in uh, a potential uh, extension to the crack ceiling project for $25,000, which would cover those two additional things, Cook Road and then the uh, concrete pavement crack ceiling. Uh, the ending fund balance is on the next to the last line there over to the far right is still about $70,000, and that actually is pretty close to what we had estimated back in February uh, before uh, the bids closed on the SR-20 Cascade Trail project. Mm -hmm. The allocation for that project went down from 120 to 75 with the bids that we received. So it really doesn't affect our ending fund balance at the end of the year to do this, uh, but this is a good use for these funds, and I, I do strongly recommend that we move ahead with that. And so I've provided you with some motions to that effect here and would appreciate your action on that tonight. You know, we have the contractor uh, stop now on finishing up uh, the rest of the project, um, and they have us in their schedule in a couple weeks to come back and do the uh, crack ceiling on Cook Road for the uh, roundabout, and they'll be doing the other roadway if you approve it uh, on C uh, Cook Road, uh, probably in the same mobilization. So you'll find a motion on the second page. Uh, there's two parts to that. The first one authorizes me to issue a second amendment uh, to extend their contract not to exceed total from 58000 to 85000 and the second one is to authorize a uh, future budget amendment uh, to authorize an additional 25000 from the Transportation Benefit District. Thank you, Mark. Are there any questions from Council? So I bring your attention to the motions on the second page of your packet. I move to award authorized and authorized public works director Mark Freiberger to sign amendment number two to amendment number 20117-PW-15 with Hozinga Enterprises, LLC of Bellingham, Washington, increasing the not to exceed contract total from 58,000 to 85,000. The motion was made by Council Member Carnegie, seconded by Council Member Lemley to authorize Public Works Director to sign Amendment Number Two, Agreement Number uh, 2017, Public Works Tax 15, uh, increasing the not to exceed contract total from 58,000 to 85,000. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. It passes. That brings us to the next motion to make it work. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to authorize a budget amendment to authorize use of an additional $25,000 from the Transportation Benefit District account for the arterial crack ceiling project. Second. The motion was made by Council Member Kinzer, seconded by Council Member Cornegay, authorizing a budget amendment to authorize the use of an additional 25000 from the TBD account for the arterial crack ceiling project. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. And the motion carries. Thank you very much. To seal my cracks. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and you do have a map, as I mentioned, the patch. You can see the ones we're planning for next year as well. It looks like it'll be just those streets uh, with a similar size project. Other things happening in, in uh, public works, as you know, Mark, can I ask you to speak into the mic so the public can hear? Yes. Other things happening uh, for public works, as you've no doubt noticed, the large pipes out on uh, Highway 20 uh, near McDonald's in that vicinity. That's the trail project from um, uh, Highway 9 South to Hodgen Road. Uh, they've installed the sewer main on that and are working on portions of the uh, sidewalk that do not have the storm drain underneath of it uh, currently. They should be starting the storm drain work itself and digging some 
the large ditches out as a result in about a week. Uh, the project is going well so far. Uh, we've had one change order. It was a actual reduction in the contract amount, so it's moving along well. David Lee is clo coordinating that closely with uh, DOT to work with their paver project, which will be done uh, in July as well. Uh, so we'll have a double whammy on our citizens for a, a few weeks there as we do our work during the daytime and they do theirs at night. Um, but anyway, the end of that's going to be a good road surface uh, on Highway 20 through Cedar Woolley from Collins to Fruitdale. And we're really looking forward to that. Mark, may I just ask a quick question? For, yes, um, Mayor. Um, uh, Mike, what, is there a picture of what it will look like in, in, here at City Hall? Uh, yes, we have the plans, but also on the website you can you can go to the PW projects or public works projects and and see a road section I believe on there. Because there's some you know awfully wide on and off sections. Are those going to be limited? Are there going to be curbs created in front of some of those businesses? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, that project uh, will uh, put defined sidewalk or defined uh, approaches to all of the businesses that currently have pretty much open access. David's worked closely with the business owners. Won't be a surprise for any of them. Okay. Um, and I think it's going to clean it up considerably and make it much safer for, oh, for folks, nice. especially yeah. walking back and forth along in there. So be yeah. nice. Um, also, uh, Nathan's crew has been very busy this spring. Uh, they prepared for the chip seal project. They pretty much got the pre-leveling done for that. And we have the county coming in. I believe it's in August to do that that work. He's nodding his head yes. Uh, David's also working on designing the CIPD sewer project. We should have that out to bid here in the next month. And uh, we also have on our books to do uh, the sidewalk and ADA uh, ramp upgrade project for this year. We had the complete streets grant for that. It doesn't look like due to workload we're going to get that out early. Uh, if we do get it out, it's going to be fairly late. Uh, and at this point, I'm assuming it's going to be 2018. The TIP funds are a two-year program, so we uh, can easily do that in 18 uh, without any issues. I'd still like to do it, and I'll keep putting the pressure on, but in reality is starting to sink in here in June. Mark, on those ADA things, what's the latest design standard? I know we've got some that everybody trips over that was a dis required. Um, have they changed from that, the ones that drop off and people are stepping off and no, jogging I, their knees? And they haven't. In fact, that's that's the standard uh, is those barrier curb sections. They, I, I don't like them either. They're, they're terrible. We go around and paint them, as you see, uh, to make them a bit more visible. But, yeah, I, I believe they're a tripping hazard, but... That's that's what the law is, and that's what we're building. That's so okay, thank you. We all become and Americans they, with the ADA. And they all they crack <laughs> up really easily. I mean, they're always falling apart. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're a tire hazard for cars that deviate from the roadway a little bit, too. We've, <laughs> we've had a few of those broken oh. off. Um, I'm sure the Mark, um, tires were similar. Some of the, some of the people, Harold's not hearing real well, so if you could just speak loudly. And Jermaine, if you move your mic closer to... He's doing great. The people are there. Oh, okay, I got it. Aaron, do we have any extra earbuds for him? <laughs> I did want to mention as well that we have in our, our plans for this summer to pave the city parking lot over by Wells Fargo. That That is in our uh, yeah. project list for the year. Oh, and, uh, we also, uh, Aaron already mentioned this, but the sign... Uh, the downtown sign uh, will go in on the uh, roundabout information sign over near the uh, former uh, landscaping supply business over there. That's on order, and that'll be going in shortly as well. Yeah, I Thank know. you, Mayor. Thank you. Aaron, anything? Well, there's been lots going on. Um, I went to an all-day training today that was kind of interesting on continuity of government put on by our, our FEMA friends. Um, so we'll, you know, we budgeted in the 2017 budget to do some emergency management planning and training. And uh, I guess like Mark, it, it is already the middle of June. Uh, that, that reality is setting in. Um, 
but it would be very useful, I think, for us ultimately to scale up, uh, you know, much like the police and the fire are doing with the schools, and have a, a, a drill that assumes, you know, we'd do a drill with everybody here, but then let's assume the mayor is, uh, you know, he, he drove to get an old pickup. I mean, it's totally hypothetical, uh, possibly out of state. Maybe the car broke down on the way back, and then boom. <laughs> We've got an emergency event, and who are we looking for? How are we going to manage it? Maybe I can't get there. Uh, maybe one of the chiefs is missing, and on and on. So, you know, uh, maybe assume the event is that our building here burns down. So you, you throw in a couple of different variables that very quickly complicate how the city of Cedarville continues to operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we've got a lot of good pieces of the puzzle in place, but one very clearly missing piece of the puzzle is we haven't tested that system. We, ha we haven't called you up out of the blue and said, hey, Mayor Pro Tem, you're on. Um, sorry, you can't go to work today. you got to come here. We're sending an officer to get you. Um, this is what's going on. We need you now kind of a thing and then see what happens. So maybe more to follow on that as things continue on. I also wanted to let you know we uh, we received a resignation letter from one of our police officers today. Officer Wagonar has uh, given notice her last day is the end of June. So uh, you'll see uh, us posting and beginning the process for hiring a new police officer. Uh, that process is time consuming, so we're, we're going to have to look first at uh, whether we're seeking a lateral candidate or a new hire and then work through the normal civil service process as we all got familiar with these last couple of years to begin that process process of developing a list and hiring somebody. And other than that, uh, it just seems like there's a lot going on right now. So um, just continuing to work on lots of different projects. And that's all I've got for tonight. Thank you, Aaron. Patsy? Thank you, Mayor. As John mentioned, that construction is increasing in our city limits, and I'd like to report that the composition of the sales tax revenue the city receives is changing. Um, we're now seeing about 15% of our total sales tax coming from construction-related um, entities, and it's about two months from the time the sales tax is paid to the company and it actually makes its way to the city. And so I expect that percentage will probably increase as we get uh, through those summer months. Well, that's good news. Thank you. Yes. Judith. Nothing. I'm going to be down in uh, Vancouver at the AWC um, for a few days next week. So I'll report yeah. at the next meeting. Learn a lot and bring some back for us. Thanks. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> Jermaine? Actually, tomorrow I'm going to be attending on an opiates. Speaking in the mic. Sorry. So. Uh, Community Action is doing a, an opiates uh, seminar. Or, I'm not sure exactly, but I guess we're going to be learning about drug abuse in the community. And I'm looking forward to that. That's tomorrow. Um, I think it's like limited peoples, but I'm pretty sure they have seats still available if anyone's interested. It's just $5 if you want to get lunch. Um, and I'll report back what I hear about that. Uh, another thing was um, with the logger rodeo parade and all that coming up, I was hoping to work on um, having recycling centers set up. And I know I've been talking to friends who uh, do these big... <laughs> I guess uh, kind of a more instructional way of recycling, and I thought that there, and it's from what I understand, it doesn't cost anything, and I want to find out more about that. But I'm just hoping that that's something that we can work on. Please, <laughs> um, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> and, uh, and another thing I wanted to say was just Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Thank you. Brenda. <laughs> A um, couple things tonight, Mark in engineering and Nathan in public works, thank you very much for getting the speed bump put in down on the corner of uh, Wally and Nelson. It is really slowing people down and I did watch that location on graduation night and people slowed down and I 
think it's really going to keep more damage or potential accidents or harm to people from happening. So thanks for making that happen. And the neighborhood thanks you. I've heard a lot from a lot of people too. So um, one other thing um, that I might be is probably in your department too, Mark. Um, on State Street, in between Bingham Place and Greenleaf on the north side, there's not really a sidewalk there, but there's a little path that people take to walk on. And there's a lot of um, brush that has grown over the fence from the house there so that people can't walk there. And I received complaints from people that they have to take strollers down off that. People delivering newspapers that have to walk on that side. I do understand there is a sidewalk on the other side, but for specific reasons why they have to walk on that side, it's impassable right there. And it's making people a little bit nervous. So maybe that's something you could take a look at. Uh, can be requested they cut the homeowner cut the brush back. I, I don't know how does that work. Do that's we, a code enforcement a code issue. Enforcement? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Foster so cars between Green 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 Street Green Street Boulevard. Green Street Boulevard and Bingham Place. Um, yeah. Anything else, Brenda? No, that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Jermaine's indicating she has an alibi. Go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to actually thank you for doing that and reminding me. I just wanted to thank Mark for um, yesterday morning I got a knock on my door that I had water all over my driveway and out into the street. And um, I could see water flowing, actually. My water in the house was fine. And um, all day long it ran and I panicked while I was at work. Um, my neighbors were nice enough to tell me. Um, I called PUD and this morning they fixed it. And it was nicely done, but I slept last night because um, Mark came by and looked at it, and I trusted his word that I'm not going to be um, in a sinkhole this morning <laughs> because I saw cracks in the sidewalk, and there was a lot of water, and who knows how long that's been going on. So I was a little worried, and I just wanted to thank you for coming by and checking that out. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, Chuck. Yeah, I, I just wanted to pass on to John that uh, Hanson Brothers has got their fence up and he's cleaning up pretty good around there. So Ernest wanted me to thank you. You can, you can thank Lara Carr, the code enforcement officer. She did most of the work. Yeah, it, look, it looks good. It's looking a lot, lot better. Rick? Thanks to Nathan and his crew. I wasn't so much involved in blast from the past this year, but... Awesome. And there was some concern, Paula was saying that there's concerns from vendors because of the building fire and that, but I think they, the city and the chamber pulled it off once again. Good turnout. Good things. As usual, they pulled through. The cars. Thank you. Brett? I just want to address a couple of things that were brought up at tonight's meeting. Um, I know we had a professional installer come in and look at the air conditioning at the senior center, and they dis discussed to us that it was not effective. Um, but we had the senior center building committee board come meet and, and request some better options. And I, can you, Aaron, can you refresh us with what those better options would be? Yeah, so I think this was, was it the last meeting? The, uh, the chairperson of the Senior Center Advisory Committee and the Senior, Server, Senior Center Director came. Um, what, what they recommended and ultimately what the council voted to do at the last meeting was to remove the skylight over the, the large room, uh, replace it with uh, trusses and a solid roof, and then uh, construct transom windows up there uh, that will allow light to still filter in naturally, but it won't be the same direct light as is currently coming through those acrylic skylights. Uh, the contractor then will also install an exhaust fan up there, which would allow for the heat that's rising to be uh, vented out of the building. Uh, we also talked about uh, possibly some low E finishes to the windows on the south side and uh, possibly relamping some 
more of the lighting with LEDs, which would uh, potentially reduce heat and improve efficiency. So, you know, the concern that was expressed to uh, Nathan in, in that pre-bid and bid context for air conditioning was uh, clearly no problem putting in a system for $35,000, but we weren't getting contractors who thought they could guarantee it would actually work due to that large room and skylight situation. So, um, you know, to refresh the recollection, we, uh, we the, the city went back to the Senior Center Advisory Committee and said, here's what we're planning to do, uh, $35,000 from the council for air conditioning. Is that what you want? And the user group themselves said, well, actually, we'd prefer if you do these other things. So um, this came from the users. I, I, don't, I don't know how else to answer that, but we went and talked directly to the people who use the building, and they have their own structure for how they kind of self-govern and advise on those operations, and um, that's what they voted to do and came and asked the council to do. Yeah, I appreciate that information. Also, um, earlier we, we spoke to someone about parking down Town, and I know parking has long been an issue, but I like to compare ourselves to Mount Vernon, who only has four spots per block, and we have triple that. But I know we do have time parking in front of the chamber. I do believe it's 15 minutes, but I think elsewhere in the city, we may benefit from having time parking maybe an hour, uh, you know, a spot like that every block, just to, to kind of have a free motion of cars, uh, you know, in, you know, in, in some of the high congested areas. Maybe especially, you know. Well, there, there is a time limit on on most of that of Metcalf. Well, three. I, I get three hours, but I mean, you know, with the chamber, they have the, the Department of Licensing in there. And they want people in and out, but so do a lot of you know retail. They they drive our tax dollars, and so I think there's other locations in the city that could benefit from having shorter than three hour time parking. And I, I would like maybe to take this to like a planning committee or something just to kind of look at the topic, what can we do to help address maybe freeing up some of that parking on a more regular basis than three hours or longer. And yeah, I, I would encourage you to include the uh, chamber or at least a group of merchants. Uh, yeah. You know my background being from La Conner, uh, you know, First Street for many years, if I owned a business, I'd, I'd get there early, park across the street in front of your business, yeah. and you'd roll in and park by my business. <laughs> so that, you know, the solution in that little town, you know, they look at uh, metering, parking, time limits with enforcement. Ultimately, the town bought property to build a parking lot, which they charged visitors for, but were free to merchants with a kind of a locals pass. And then there's a uh, you know a self enforcement of you and your employees park down there. Let's let the customers park in front. Um, you know, my perception downtown, and the mayor and I were just down there. I don't think was it yesterday. Yesterday. Um, the people who are blocking the streets are not customers. You know, they don't show up and spend all day at the antique store. Breakfast doesn't last all day at the bakery. You know, it's people who live nearby and leave cars there. That was the complaint we were dealing with yesterday. Or folks who work in offices and therefore don't have a vested interest in the retail commerce and just park out front for convenience. Or, or just fellow downtown merchants and employees, uh, bar owners was a complaint we got also the other day, who don't care. You know, So I guess what I'm suggesting is you really need the user group to buy in because the solutions that the city has primarily are sending officer car down with the chalk and the ticket book, which we can do and have done, but it, it doesn't work nearly as well as getting the people who are users downtown to agree that really merchants should park in the lot and customers should park in front. Yeah, and I, and I agree with that. I, I don't think we would limit every single parking space to you know 30 minutes or whatever, but I think it's something we should look at. And also, as to the lot, that's there is also partially privately owned by the Masonic Lodge, and we've finally come to terms on, on, on you know, going in together and replacing that. So, Aaron, do you know when that might be replaced? I don't, but I'll bet you Nathan knows. <laughs> It's on the list. It's on the list. It's on the list. No, it's it's honestly it's it's, yeah. we're gonna try and do it, you know, probably in September time frame. Yeah. Is so that page one of the list or is it on page two of the list? That's a, a big item on the list, it's an important one. Yeah, no. And we're gonna do everything we can to get it done, but um, September. Yeah, thank you. Is that it, Brett? Yes. 
Okay, so I had uh, a fun time. I got to go shoot with our police officers up at the range the other day. I think I did pretty good. I want to congratulate all the graduates from uh, Cedar Valley High School and State Street High School. Had their uh, ceremony yesterday. I went down and watched that for a little bit. It's a great thing to see our kids doing so well and moving on. Um, one of the most poignant pictures I saw was uh, Drew Onks holding up uh, Jake's number three jersey because Jake would have graduated this year. Um, but he drowned. And uh, anyway, uh, YMCA is doing their last push for money to fund that facility, and I really want to see that a success so we don't lose any more kids who didn't know how to swim. So we will be uh, going into. Um, closed session for about 10 minutes under RCW 4230.1404, collective bargaining with action possible. So you're welcome to wait uh, if you like, but if not, uh, thank you all for coming tonight, and um, we hope to see you next time. So the council is back from executive session at 8.38. I move we adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Go home. Thank you all for coming.